Greetings, earth calling intrepid time travellers. It's that time of the week again. Uh, it's always great to have you with me. Uh, I won't want to hurtle through time and space all on my own. Uh, and technically we crisscross the British Isles and we cover a million years of history, but as if that weren't big enough, I feel we do something even grander than that. And I wouldn't want to do it without you. Um, it's a journey that takes us, oh, from our ancient ancestors, it kicks off a million years ago. I, I, I never get, I never get tired of, of, of dreaming about that. that. That's a period of time that I associate with the rise of mountains and and the falling of valleys. Um, but here we are. It's it's the human story. The human story of the British Isles is at least that old. We hurtle past Stonehenge and we see kings and queens in the rearview mirror. And we, talk about battles and bloodshed, the Industrial Revolution, war and war and war again. We encounter geniuses and goodies and baddies and everything in between them. What can I say? This is a set of islands that I love and a story that I love like no other and hopefully you're here because you feel the same way. Before we get started on this week's episode, I need to say, I want to say a huge thank you to all of you. Everyone who signed up to the Patreon site, I don't take it for granted. There are hundreds of you out there who, who, who join me, Paul and I, every week. Uh, it, it's, it's what makes the, the love letter to the British Isles possible in many ways. That, that podcast is and always will be free. And it's, the, it's Patreon that, that makes that possible. So the fact that you are here with me, every single one of you, I receive letters from all over the world. Um, uh, I, I get contacted via Instagram, via social media. And knowing that, that this network, this this congregation, this community is out there and that we, we have something in common, we are united by something, I think it's fantastic, it's special. If you're not a member yet and you want to join, uh, go to patreon.com, uh, search for me by name, Neil Oliver. Do fill in, the, fill in the details and join up. And every week you get a new and exclusive video. I film them here at my home in Stirling. It's an eclectic mix of stuff. Oh, it's how I see the present day intersecting and interacting with what's happened in the past. So it's history and comment, basically, and it also has a touch of my philosophy of life. God help us all. Uh, hopefully you find it thought-provoking. I do. It's it's an insight, I suppose, for what it's worth into the way I, that what makes me tick. Okay, it's enough about me. It's time for the next episode of The Love Letter to the British Isles. Strap yourself into the time machine, people. Cue the music. Over the last, well, nearly 20 years, I've had the great privilege, opportunity, luck to see all around the archipelago of the British Isles. So as well as England, Wales and Scotland, I've been around and around the island of Ireland as well. And it's as homely to me now as anywhere else. You know, one of the experiences I've had over the years is that because I've seen so much, seen, I've been back to places so many times that I feel as at home, as welcome uh, in the southwest of Ireland as I do in the northeast of Scotland or in the southeast of England or in Wales. Uh, all the national boundaries have, have blurred and, and dissolved for me and I just see one place. But because I had been unfamiliar with Ireland for longer, you know, I was much older before I got to Ireland for the first time. It was a revelation. In this week's podcast, we're walking with the dead, stepping into tombs that are surrounded by ancient symbols and carefully aligned with the seasons. Places where our ancestors came together, celebrated and grappled with what it means to be human. I'm stepping out across Britain to discover 100 remarkable places that have shaped you, me and the whole world. I'm Neil Oliver, and this is my love letter to the British Isles. In last week's podcast, we travelled with you to the heart of an ancient power base on Orkney. Where's the next stop on your journey? 
on the east coast of Ireland, uh, in, in the south, there's a river called the Boyne. And there, in that valley of the River Boyne, Bruna Boyne in Irish, is another valley of the kings. Another place of the most extraordinary early monuments, raised, built by the hands of the first farmers in Ireland. Uh, the monuments there, uh, standing stones and chamber tombs for the dead, are older than the Great Pyramid of Cheops. They're older than the, the Valley of the Kings in Egypt. They're of a, a smaller scale, of course. There's nothing on the scale of the pyramids. And they are more roughly hewn. Uh, everything is built of, of, uh, of unworked boulders. Uh, so they have a rough, primitive nature and look which is distinct from what you see, what people are familiar with seeing in the, in the Egyptian tombs that they've seen on television or, or in person. Uh, but it's a wonder to behold because they're so old and what you're seeing there is, is the beginning of an idea. Very early on, uh, the farmers, it would appear that before they built themselves structures, houses of stone, you know, they, they, would, have, they would have lived in houses, you know, raised of you know, timber, wattle and daub, turf, but the first structures that they made of stone were not for the living, but for the dead. And having a special place in which to keep the bones, the remains of the ancestors, seems to have been a very high priority for them. Before they bent their backs to raising houses for the living, they were careful to build houses for the dead. And it would appear that, in part, this, this need, which is expressed in the area called the, the, the Bruna Boyne, the Valley of the, the Boyne in County Meath, uh, it was territorial. It was part of an expression of ownership of the land. Uh, I think I've said before that as far as we imagine, the, the hunters, the hunter-gatherers, probably felt owned by the landscape and felt that they were related to the big animals, the, the bears, the wolves, the deer. Farmers were different. They felt that they owned the land. Uh, and with that came maybe feelings of responsibility, obligation, but they certainly wanted to be able to demonstrate to any incomers that they had territorial rights. They had, they had occupied the place long before, not just themselves, but their parents, their grandparents, their great-great-grandparents. And the way that they made that visual was by keeping some of the bones of the ancestors. When, when some people died, uh, their bones were kept and they were placed into the tombs. And it meant, presumably, that if, if newcomers came into your area and they maybe posed a threat, maybe they would want your fields, maybe they would want to be on your land, you could say, look, this isn't just my land. This is the land of my parents and grandparents and great-grandparents, and I can prove that because in this special building over here on the boundary between these two fields is a tomb. And if you come with me, I'll show you the bones of the ancestors. And maybe there was more as well. Perhaps people felt that it gave them continued access to the people who had lived and died before them. You know, rather than bury the bones in a grave where they would never be seen again, uh, maybe they preferred, or they seemed to have preferred, to keep them somewhere that they had access to. Uh, so the tombs of the sort that they built in the Valley of the Boyne, they were open. They, weren't, they didn't put the bones in the tomb and then, and then close them off. For a long time, the tombs were open and people were coming and going from them, going in, adding more bones, taking bones away. We always call these structures tombs, as though they're all about the dead. And they were certainly partly about the dead, but we store bones under the floor of churches. Uh, we have tombs inside cathedrals, but obviously there's much more happens in a church and in a cathedral than just looking after the dead. And probably the same is true of those tombs, uh, that as well as as a repository for the remains of the ancestors, there were places where other acts were performed, other rituals that were part of the, the daily life. What's the difference between the sites, Newgrange and Noth? Newgrange uh, is probably the most famous. It's about 250 feet across, but they are properly described as, as monumental, megalithic architecture. You're talking about them being the work of many people, many strong people, to create these structures. Newgrange is, is big by, by any mortal human being's estimate. It's a large structure. It's circular, uh, about 250 feet across. It was extensively excavated uh, in, in the 1960s and 70s, and when the work was finished, 
a decision was taken to reconstruct the tomb, to, to kind of reimagine what it might have looked like when it was finished, you know, when it was in its prime. And so it has a very striking architectural appearance, a wall of white pebbles. Uh, and some people like it. Some of the purists have questions because they say, you've got no way of knowing that that's what it looked like. But once you get inside, once you get inside the tomb, there is no denying the impact that it has on any sentient being. Uh, there's a, a passageway. So you go in, you go in a, a, a narrow, a relatively narrow entrance, and then there's a passageway lined and paved in big stones, slabbed. Uh, it's about 60 feet in length, and you're going into the heart of the tomb in a straight line. You arrive in a chamber, a chamber where, amongst other things, remains of, of, of human beings were found. But in terms of paying attention to the skill of the architects, the, the chamber is about six feet higher than the entrance. So by the end of the 60 feet, you have, you've walked uphill and you're now six feet higher than you were. In an act of incredible imagination and creativity, the architects, they incorporated what's been called a light box over the door of the, of the entrance, uh, above the lintel. They created an open window. The passageway itself is aligned upon the place of the rising sun on a specific day of the year, in midwinter. And when the sun rises above the horizon, the light goes into the entrance of the tomb and it creeps along the passageway inch by inch and eventually it reaches the chamber itself and as a finale the light touches upon a carved artwork on a vertical slab on a wall of the chamber it's called a triskelion which is like a, a spiral engraved in the rock it's been interpreted many ways. It, 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 in that context, it probably refers to or, 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 or is to make a person think about the endless, the ceaseless unspooling of time. The spectacle only lasts 17 minutes. The light enters, stays on the Triskelion, and then the moment passes and it's gone. But the people who designed and built New Grange, they thought about all of this in advance and took care to lay everything out and shape everything so that it works. The builders probably had many ideas, but by bringing the light of the dawn at the end of the longest night of the year into contact with something that symbolised the unspooling of time, perhaps they were encouraging the idea that life was returning to the ancestors. That it's an idea of the, here, here amongst the ancestors, the finger of life. You know, like, like, this, like the painting on the roof of the Sistine Chapel, where God's finger comes across to, to Adam's and there's a little gap and you're left to imagine it, the, the life, creation, leaping the gap like a thought across a synapse in the brain up there on the, on the, on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Well, something of the same aspiration might be there in the, in the architecture and the artistry of New Grange, the idea of life, the life of the sun, the great life-giving force of sunlight re-entering this place and triggering the start of the year again like the spark of creation. It's overwhelming and it's it's rare. It's as rare as hen's teeth. I mean, the, like I say, the days when the sun rises above a, a, in a clear blue sky at dawn in County Meath in Midwinter's Day, there's not a lot, it doesn't often happen, but when it does, it's a miracle. It's so fascinating that the ancient people were grappling with these thoughts. Yeah, you're always being confronted. It's back, all the way back to the beginning, you catch glimpses that seem to suggest that from the beginning, people were asking the same big questions. Where do we come from? What's life all about? What are we supposed to do? What does it mean to be alive and then after a period of time to be dead? What does, what does all that tell us? People have been wrestling with that, however busy their lives, however challenging their circumstances, whatever environment they've lived in, it, it rises to the surface, you know, st stubbornly and determinedly, this question, why are we here? What does it mean? 
What can we understand just from looking around us? Why every 365 days does the thing start to repeat again? And so that cyclical nature that people were awake, they're farmers. So they're preoccupied with, with, the, with the seasons because they need the time to plant, the, the harvest, the, the seeds to grow and to ripen, a harvest, and then they've got to get through the darkness of winter before the thing starts again. So they're aware subliminally at first and then consciously of the cycle of life, the circle of life, the repeating pattern of the seasons. And this is probably why they're preoccupied from very early on with circles. If you look at the moon, it's a circle. If you can bear to glimpse the sun, it's a circle. When a, a, a vibrating blade of, of seagrass on the sand leaves a circle, you know, when a wave collapses and breaks, it's a circle. When a fern uncurls at the start of its life, it's, a, it's an ever-expanding circle. They're confronted with circles all the time. And so they start to respect that shape in the landscape. So they build circles. At first, just ditches, banks and ditches. Then they raise stones as well in circles. And the tombs that they build, like New Grange, and within sight of New Grange is another huge tomb of the same age. I mean, these things are 5,000 years old and it's called Noth. And it's another huge circular tomb. Uh, in, the, in the case of Noth, there are two passageways. One comes in from the west into quite a small chamber, but coming in from the east, it arrives in another chamber, much more spectacular. And in that chamber were found the remains of 121 human beings. Uh, the two the two chambers are sort of back to back inside the inside the great mound of the tomb, and everything about it suggests a womb of the world. Everything about it suggests that people were deliberately, as, amongst other things, creating a, a pregnant womb where they put the bones of the dead, but where they also expected other things to happen, for life itself to germinate. And this was why they aligned the passageways on the rising sun, the setting sun. Midsummer, midwinter, it, it, it takes various forms at different tombs around the countryside. People had different preoccupations, but it's always about paying attention to the seasons of the year. What does the tomb at Noth look like? Where it, at New Grange it was reconstructed, at Noth the, 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 the stones are as they were, and there are great uh, uh, vertical slabs around the outside of the tomb and they're, they're covered with artworks, etchings and engravings, circles and other shapes. Half of all the, uh, the Neolithic art in Europe is found in that one tomb in Noth, in County Meath. Half of it, half of the artwork, either around the kerb, around the outside or incorporated elsewhere within the fabric of the building. You know, these people at Newgrange and elsewhere at North, they were artists as well. They're, they're expressing all sorts of ideas. Uh, and it's just the most profoundly moving experience to be in the presence of ancient thought. You, you expect, in your, in your rational moments, you expect certain things would last for thousands of years. Like a carved stone. OK, I get it. If someone it deeply engraves into a stone, I can imagine that after thousands of years it will still be there. What you're confronted with is the idea that thoughts survive. The way that people were thinking, a flash of inspiration in someone's mind 5,000 years ago, well, you can see it. As well as alongside the carved stone, the thought, the ephemeral thought survives as well. Do scholars study these symbols to try and work out if they were part of a forgotten language? That's an excellent question. Yes, they do. Um, th people have been trying to interpret them for as long as they've been aware of them. Uh, th there, there's very often uh, a, a circular element to the designs, spirals, cups, cups surrounded by rings, all of it engraved and etched into the stone. We see it as art. You know, that's always the word that 19th and 20th century scholars applied but but we do that in a kind of helplessness really because it's abstract to us and because we can't read it we call it art 
and maybe it is art, but it, it could just as well be um, phrases or, or words or letters in a language that we simply haven't cracked. You know, it took a long time. It took until the discovery of the Rosetta Stone uh, in, the new, in the Napoleonic era uh, and the interpretation thereof before people were able finally to crack the Egyptian hieroglyphs and work out what it meant, what that language was. And so far, no one has cracked the language of, of that kind of Neolithic Stone Age art. And so we just call it art, as though the people were just making pretty pictures. But, and maybe they were, but it's at least as likely that, they were, that the people at the time looked at certain symbols and read them and got information from them. Keep off the grass. Exactly. Here's the way, or here is the way to heaven. Follow this path. Here is a reminder that your life is unspooling out of your control and that eventually you'll come to the end of your thread. When you stand in front of these mounds, what do they say to you? Every, every idea that I have about these places and, and the ideas that other people have had that I've read about, you have to be careful because there is an, an unshakable fact that you cannot, as a 21st or 20th century born person, put yourself back inside the mind of a Neolithic farmer. You, that, you can forget that because you, you're not going to get there. But it's impossible as a human being to look at those shapes and not have a suggestion of the feminine. The Egyptian pyramids are about straight lines and there's something quite kind of masculine and uh, almost autistic about the obsession with straight lines and right angles. In these Neolithic tombs, it's all about curves and, you know, the, and, the, and, and suggestion of, of pregnant wombs or breasts or, or something of the feminine. And inside, the fact that they have a passage leading inside and into a chamber that's, su that's suggestive of a womb. And it, it was into that womb that the, that the remains of the dead were placed. You know, it, it, so it, it's almost like a, a mirroring, a bookending, that we came out of a, a chamber inside our mothers and we came out through a passage into the world. And so it made sense to them to think, well, now that this person has died, we should reverse the process and go back up a passage, back into a womb. And if, we, if we're careful and we, and we align the passage on the rising sun or the setting sun and that warmth of life is reintroduced, maybe it ensures not, not the return to life of those specific individuals, but that it will continue the process of, of life, the cyclical process of dying and then new life. It's, it's an expression in the landscape of that, of that need. Why is it we know relatively little about these ancestors? I think it's um, it's the extreme passage of time, you know, uh, 5,000 years at least separate us from them. And furthermore, because of the, the, the extreme depth of time, uh, we find scant remains, really. Uh, we call them Stone Age because most of what we find that they left behind was that which had been made of stone because stone lasts all through the millennia. So we don't see the other things, the soft things. You know, we don't see the clothes that they had made of uh, skin and fur and leather and all the rest. The, the shoes that they fashioned for their feet, the bedding, the soft furnishings, the things that they used to make their lives comfortable and warm. We don't find that. So we tend to think of them as living, you know, like... Um, uh, like Fred Flintstone and Barney Rubble yeah. lying on stone beds, you know, with, you know, stone <laughs> wheels. It, it simply wasn't like that. And so the, this, the, the sense of them as people with our sensitivity is lost uh, because all we find is broken stone by and large. Uh, so you just have to be a little bit more, I suppose, imaginative, receptive... What were their day-to-day -day lives like? For sure the people were, were living simpler lives than ours. Uh, they would, have, by and large, have been living in homes made of wood, a wattle and daub, roofed with uh, turf, roofed with reeds, whatever was available. And yet they still aspired to, to create things that would last. Hence the structures like the tombs that they built in stone, because they already perceived that these would last, they would outlive them. 
And you don't have to go back too far in time, only a few hundred years from our own, uh, to get back to a period when, when most people similarly lived in structures that we would regard as much more temporary. Things of timber, things of wattle and daub. And in your average town and village, the only stone buildings would have been the church, or the cathedral, if the town was big enough, the castle that was there as the headquarters of the of the warlord who, who held sway in that particular part of the world. Um, so, you know, they were they were looking even in those times to make structures that would last, that would outlive them, and that they would that would be used again by the next generation. There's undoubtedly sophistication in the way they were thinking. You just have to look harder to see it, to find it. Despite the 5,000 or so years that separate us, are their concerns and aspirations as similar to ours as they seem? Yes. Yes, they were looking to make their lives as comfortable as possible. Uh, you know, they would have had a uh, a simpler diet, but they would have taken advantage of everything that was available to them. They would have been more inventive, more canny, and more conservative about, about their food supplies. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, they would have eaten and taken advantage of fresh bread. You know, they would have made porridge and, and simple soups. They would have uh, hunted. Uh, they would have still taken advantage of the wild animals that were around them in the landscape. You know, so there would have been the occasional meat. There would be fish. They would have taken fish from the rivers, fish from the sea. They would have collected wild provender uh, to supplement and augment their diet. At times, there would have been surplus food. You know, they, they had enough and then some. And that gave them spare time in which they were able to specialise. So they were able to give over some of their time to making tools, becoming very specialised in craft, uh, becoming very skillful. Architecture uh, became something that they were able to contemplate. And they were thinking up ways to make these great uh, buildings. The tombs, the, the chambers inside, are achieved by a, an architectural technique called corbelling, uh, where you, you step in each uh, successive layer of, of stonework, each one edging further and further in until eventually a, a small space can be capped with a single cap stone. These are problem-solving techniques. They're thinking about, you know, how do we build a big space inside this mound, you know, that will, will that will support the weight above it and that will give us room in which to stand. And the architects and designers amongst them were coming up with the solutions. You know, they're they are clever people intimately connected to their landscape and taking advantage of everything that, that they can lay their hands on. Building a large dome ceiling is not an easy thing to do, is it? No, it's not. Uh, it would have been achieved that by trial and error. Uh, no doubt the first structures were of wood. It's easier to work with wood. It's, it's lighter. Uh, and the, the skills of carpentry and woodworking would have been there first. Uh, and a majority of the structures that people uh, took advantage of and, and used in their day-to-day -day lives would have, been, would have been made of things other than stone. Stone is much more difficult. It's heavy. It's harder to work. It's harder to shape. Uh, and then when it comes to it, once you raise a wall of it, you're dealing with a serious weight. Uh, and to get to a point where you can put a roof on it, it's, you know, you've got to be clever and inventive. These people were smart, smarter than most of us. We, we just live inside buildings that other people build. We don't know how to do it. <laughs> we, do, we, we drive cars, but we don't know how to fix them. You know, we use computers, but we don't know how they work. These people had to understand uh, everything in their own lives. You know, each family would have been able to clear a field, uh, seed it with crop, uh, take care of it until it was uh, available for harvesting. Then they were able to process the raw material into food that they could eat, they could hunt, they could build homes, they could make fire from scratch without matches. <laughs> uh, you know, these are, these are clever, talented, inventive, imaginative, resourceful, self-sufficient people. Uh, that could teach us a thing or two about how to go about their daily lives. What does the concentration of these impressive sites tell us about this area? Whatever was going on in the Valley of the Boyne, in County Meath, uh, it had become an important place. Uh, and it, and the, there were reasons why um, it was maybe valuable farmland for a start, a fertile area where the, maybe the ground, maybe it was, maybe the soil was was good for growing crops, and people valued it. Uh, and having valued it, they wanted to stake a claim on it and prove ownership. 
you know, hence they would build the tombs so that they could say, this belonged to our ancestors and now it belongs to us. Uh, and there was a prestige associated with that location. Have there been any precious artefacts found here? Within the tomb at Nauth, archaeologists found a, a, a mace head. Uh, it's, a, it's an object of sublime beauty. Uh, it was The raw material for it was a flint pebble found on a beach. Uh, geologists think it originated in Orkney, believe it or not. So either it was made by a craftsman in Orkney and it made its way eventually to, to Ireland where it was finally incorporated in the tomb, or perhaps it was just the raw pebble that came and was worked by a, a craftsman in County Meath before it went into the tomb. But it's a, a work of a great uh, skilled artist and craftsman. Uh, the, the pebble was uh, a mix of red and white colour. It's like a, It looks like a, a liquid incompletely stirred, so there are swirls of both colours. Uh, and it has been worked into a, a mace head, which is like a hammer head. A hole was drilled through the centre of it. Imagine doing that in a world without metal. You start with, you grind a, a hard material like granite into an abrasive powder, and then you would use a, a wooden stick, gr spinning it between your hands, uh, to use that abrasive powder to very painstakingly and gradually drill a hole right through a stone pebble. Imagine the investment of time and effort. Uh, the, the outer surface of the piece was worked into perfect symmetry, and there's also the suggestion on it of two eyes, uh, and then so that the, the shaft for the, for the wooden handle is like a gaping mouth with two eyes above it. And then on the side, there are two coils, as though coils of an elaborate Princess Leia style hairstyle. All of this has gone into the thinking by the artist and then has been worked over hours or days into the creation of this wondrous object. It, it would never have been used as a hammer. It, it's too special, uh, too expensive, if you like, in terms of the, the effort expended to create it. It was probably used for ceremonial uh, occasions. And then finally, perhaps to accompany some important person, it went into the tomb and it stayed there until it was subsequently found by archaeologists. So all of that, just that one object, because it, it demonstrates that there were links to Orkney, so people 5,000 years ago were, were exchanging raw materials or finished goods. And that gives you an idea of, of the distances over which people were aware of one another, making connections. They were probably travelling between by partly by boat, almost certainly using the coastline uh, to navigate between County Meath and Orkney. Maybe some of the journey was over land, but a majority of it would have been over water. People are aware of the civilization on Orkney, they're aware of what's going on in the valley of the River Boyne. They would have been aware of what was going on down in Avebury, Stonehenge. These people were all connected, aware of one another, swapping ideas, swapping raw materials and finished goods. You've got a whole civilization is one of archaeology's C words. You've got to be careful how you use it. It's like culture. You know, people get very excited when you start talking about civilization. But you've definitely got uh, traces of society and the interconnectedness of people. Uh, who see the advantage and the benefit of, of pooling resources and, and you know, paying attention to other people's ideas and, and incorporating them in your own locale. So these weren't, just, these weren't just people operating in isolation, they were part of a network. They were aware of, in the same way that we're aware of people, you know, the length and breadth of the British Isles, so were they. Just going back to that incredible flint mace head, can you explain a bit more about how it was made? Yes, by polishing and grinding, it, it's, it uses um, progressively less coarse, you start out with, with the coarsest stone ground into a rough uh, abrasive powder and you, and you use it and work it to, you know, to take the, 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 sh the sharp edges off of, of a pebble until you've eventually got a smooth pebble and then you, you can use finer and finer materials. Some of it would have been uh, chipping at it, working with harder other stones to, to break off flakes. You know, you would, you would nap it first of all to, to get a basic shape. But then it's all about grinding and polishing with, with uh, progressively fine uh, powders and down to, you know, sediments, uh, you know, to get that final glass-like, perfect, smooth surface. And that these are techniques that people had developed over long periods of time. 
Our ancestors were geologists. You know, they had to be. They, they understood different rock, different stone. And by trial and error, information learned long ago and passed from generation to generation. They had acquired great understanding and expertise in exploiting different kinds of stone, the glassy flints and obsidians and cherts, the sandstones that could be split into slabs and long sheets, you know, granite that was hard and rough, you know, limestone, chalk, all of these materials could be exploited in different ways. And then, of course, eventually that understanding of geology in due course gave them an insight into metallurgy because, of course, within some rocks there are veins of metal. You know, sometimes in amongst the rocks you find copper or, or you find gold. So from, from understanding stone, you, you, that develops eventually over thousands of years into early metallurgy. They develop from making tools of stone to making tools of metal. But it's all a progression based on experiment, insight, innovation, understanding and sharing of information. Metalwork would have been learned in one place and then that, that would have been shared. So you only need one person to work out how to do something and then gradually the information is passed by word of mouth and, 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 it, and it spreads over great distances given time. What's it like inside the tombs chambers? In the case of uh, Noth, one of the one of the chambers is still very difficult to get into. It's not even open to the public. Uh, you, you know, archaeologists have been in, and, and because I was making a documentary about the, the tombs there, I was given you know privileged access, and we crawled in and wriggled, you know, through tilted and collapsed stones until eventually we were standing inside the the ancient chamber. And to and to stand inside them. There's nothing quite like it. Everyone's familiar, I suppose, with, with how it feels to walk into a, a, a 13th century cathedral. And even as modern 21st century people were, over, were, were awed by the, by the scale and the ambition of somewhere like York Minster or, or Westminster Abbey. You know, we feel the ambition of the people that raised these great mountains of stone. Well, there is, there is something similar to be had in going into a, an internal space that was created 5,000 years ago. You're standing, you're standing within, literally within, Neolithic ambition, Neolithic creativity, Neolithic engineering. And the fact that the stone is rough and unfinished, you know, it's not masonry, it's, it's dry stone uh, architecture and, and it's simple in a way that, that should not be in any way patronising or pejorative because they had very carefully understood the limits of the technology that was available to them. It's a privilege to stand and know that you're occupying the same space that was, without a shadow of a doubt, occupied 5,000 years ago by Neolithic farmers. What we don't know and can't ever know is precisely what was going through their minds. goes through your mind when you're in the tombs? I'm always fascinated by the intimacy of the way in which they, they related to the physical remains of their dead. You know, because, because as I said before, the, the tombs were open. Eventually there came a time when the tombs were closed forever. But for long periods of time, the tombs were open, like a church, like a cathedral, and people came and went. And bodies would have been, a dead body would have been laid outside, first of all. Uh, and exposed to the elements, and birds would have, and animals would have come and picked away the flesh. And after a period of time, the, the body would have been stripped back to just bones. Okay, but those bones would still have been a bit sticky, smelly, you know, with, with all the odours you can imagine. And they would have been bundled up and brought then at that point into the tomb. And then they were incorporated within the body of the, of the collected ancestors they became, that individual became part of something greater, the ancestors. And it then was a space that was, that was inhabited by the ancestors. And so when you went into one of those tombs, you were literally in the presence of the spirits of your ancestors. But, the, but nonetheless, in a very visceral, physical sense, they were accustomed to handling and smelling the dead. And 
you have to allow that far from being horrified or disgusted or, or, or revolted by it, it must have been part of their lives. And, and they must have had a different experience of handling the dead. You know, we, we hide the dead away. You know, we have, we have undertakers that come and take away the bodies of our loved ones and they wash them and put them in a suit or in a dress and then lay them out in a coffin and put makeup on them and, and, that's, and, then, and then they disappear into the crematorium or, or into a hole in the ground. But for the longest time, people were uh, physically in contact with their dead mothers, their dead children, their dead brothers and sisters. And then even after they had been reduced to bones, they were still handling them. From time to time, you would go and get the skull of your grandfather and take it out of the tomb, and maybe take it somewhere for some other ritual, maybe take it home. Or you would go into the tomb and you would spend time with the bones of your mother, the bones of your father. That's a different, really, in many ways, a more sophisticated understand we we hide like children from the dead we want the dead taken away from us and dealt with but they they lived among it and around it and from time to time they went into the space where their that their, that their ancestors lives were continuing in some way you know the ancestors were still there and from time to time people would go into the chamber and be surrounded by the physical reality of the dead without fear maybe with a great deal of respect and reverence and love, but they weren't disgusted or revolted or afraid. You know, the dead were part of their life. Given these tombs are over 5,000 years old, it seems extraordinary they've even managed to survive. Their survival is miraculous in many ways. You know, it's not just been the passage of time. There, there, have, there were periods, say, uh, during uh, early Christianity, even even relatively late in the story of Christianity, uh, you would have ministers and, and churchmen preaching that these were places of pagan worship, uh, the stone circles and the tombs, you know, and they, and they associated with them all kinds of made-up stories and legends about witches and demons and, um, and giants turned to stone and all the rest of it. And quite often uh, a, a local churchman would incite his uh, parishioners, his congregation, to go and destroy it. You have to go and smash the stones because they were the work of the devil or they, or they were in some way tainted by evil. Uh, and Avebury, Avebury was in the process of being taken apart by the, by its, by its, by the people living nearby and they were, they were smashing up the stones and using them to build their own uh, cottages, their own houses. Uh, but they were stopped. Someone intervened and said, you know, wait a minute, this is important, we should keep some of this. Why were so many of these early buildings round? The compulsion to build circles, uh, henges, banks and ditches, circles of stone, uh, it, it was particularly powerful here in these British Isles. More circles were built in the Neolithic here than anywhere else in the world. It was a, it was a preoccupation of the people here in the British Isles. pitted and pockmarked lunar-like landscape. Over 400 vertical shafts sunk 10 metres into the ground. Deep chambers and tunnels chasing precious, high-quality flint that was coveted by our ancestors. Next time, in my love letter to the British Isles, To ensure you get each new episode of this podcast as it goes live, don't forget to subscribe. You can follow In My Footsteps as my journey unfolds across these aisles of ours by going to the website and seeing the places I've chosen and letting me know the locations that inspire you. For further reading about these favourite destinations of mine, you could try my book. It's called the story of the British Isles in 100 Places, and it's published by Transworld. Neil Oliver's Love Letter to the British Isles is produced by Neil Oliver and Paul Ratcliffe for Fat Belly Films. The music's by Malcolm Goldie. Additional research was carried out by Oscar, Evie, Lucian, 
Archie and Teddy. Finance is by Catherine and Trudy. The post-production is by Althorpe Studios. And the graphics are by Paul Plowman. And special thanks to the people across history who have made and continue to make these isles such an incredible place. This has been an FBF Podcasts production.